Uh, so uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, today, and Nikolai is going to follow up, is the problem that kind of our world uh, shades on verification. So, you know, as we know, Duke kind of mentioned, and Henry, you know, the, our world is kind of changing. And the way we do computation is changing. A lot of our computations are now are done remotely. Uh, you know, of course, there's the internet with tons of data. Uh, there's blockchain technologies where, you know, there's huge public ledgers full of data. Uh, there's machine learning algorithms that, you know, train gigantic models and large amount of data. And kind of this new reality where a lot of our kind of computations, our search queries, our queries in general to LLMs is done remotely, this generates many, many challenges, not just that of privacy. Um, so just to mention a few of these challenges, uh, okay, so of course there's an economic cha challenge related to how do we price, for example, dealing with pricing. Uh, well, there's uh, the privacy challenge that we just heard quite a bit about. How do we ensure that our data remains private, even though we kind of send our queries or uh, our, uh, you know, all our data uh, elsewhere? And the problem I'm going to talk about today, though, is that of integrity. So when we ask a question or when we kind of uh, outsource some computation, how do we know that the result we get back is the actual result? How do we ensure that integrity holds? So that's the question uh, that I'm going to focus on now. And in particular, I'm going to look at, uh, at a certain angle. Uh, Nikolai will look at a different angle of the same question. The uh, specific question I'm going to talk about uh, today is verifying a computation. OK, so here is the setting. I have some program M, you can think of it as a Turing machine, as a circuit, whatever uh, computational model you want. But I have some program M. I have some input, X. This program runs in a very long time. I'm not running it. Someone else is running it. They give me an answer Y. OK, so I'm outsourcing some computation. Compute this program M and input X. Give me the output. I get Y. How do I know that Y is the correct output? So what I want is a certificate that certifies kind of this, like a proof that certifies this is the correct output, OK? And the guarantees I want from this certificate, first, what we call completeness is that indeed one can generate such a certificate. In other words, let's say this computation takes time t. Well, we want to ensure that one can generate the certificate, of uh, valid certificate, in time not much more than T. So you know, in real world, these things can actually be computed, these certificates. And importantly, the size of the certificate and the time to verify the certificate should be much, much, much smaller than T. OK, so the size of the certificate and the time to verify should be very, very small. Okay, otherwise, what's the point? I'll do everything on my own device. OK, so these certificates should be succinct and efficiently verifiable. OK, how about soundness? Essentially, what we want to make sure is you can't fake it. OK, <laughs> what do we mean you can't fake it? If Y is not the correct output, you should not be able to generate a valid certificate. Now, usually when we say the soundness says, it's impossible. It's impossible. There, it, there doesn't exist a short proof certifying false computations. This turns out is too much to hope for. We don't believe we, we can generate, you know, we can hope for such soundness. However, we can do something good enough. Okay, so what can we hope for? To say, if Y is not the correct output, then it should be practically impossible to generate a valid certificate. Now, what do I mean by practically impossible? And this is where, by the way, I'm a cryptographer here at CSAIL. And this is where cryptography comes in. What we can prove, well, if there is some adversary, some malicious party that really you know, manages somehow to certify an incorrect computation, it must be that that guy, that malicious uh, party, can break my cryptographic assumption. So I'm going to kind of use cryptography there. And my soundness guarantee says that assuming you, 
you know, my assumption cannot be broken. My hardness assumption, learning with error, for example, or uh, there are a whole slew of assumptions. Uh, assuming the assumption cannot be broken, uh, a, a valid certificate cannot be found for a malicious, for a fa uh, false statement. So this is kind of uh, what, uh, this is my goal, okay, to do such efficient uh, verification of computation. Uh, this is called, by the way, computational soundness because we're only guaranteeing soundness again a computationally bounded adversary, an adversary that cannot break uh, my assumption. And such certificates are often called in the literature SNARGs. I don't know, how many people have heard the term SNARG? Okay, um, some. Okay, so SNARG stands for a succinct, non interactive argument. Argument is another word for computational soundness. Okay, it's a non interactive, it's just a certificate, it's succinct, and it's not a proof, it's an argument because of the computational soundness. So that's a SNARG. And what I want to uh, show you today is how to construct such SNARGs. Okay, so here's the theorem that actually we'll try to, I'll try to kind of show you how to prove. Uh, uh, the theorem says that there exists such a SNARG, such a certificate for every computation. Every computation I can generate a SNARG under standard cryptographic assumption. Okay, an example is the learning with error that we know talked about. We have other assumptions as well, some other number of theoretic assumptions. So I'm going to try to give you today a little hint of how you construct such a SNARGs. Okay, questions? Yeah, Adam. <coughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna explain. Okay, yeah, I am gonna talk about what every computation means. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, when in practice are SNARGs important? Uh, currently, uh, these SNARGs are deployed in blockchain. Uh, a, 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 and blockchains, for example, Ethereum and other blockchain companies uses them because to verify computation, like a transaction, it's a huge computational burden. You need, it's very uh, a, a hard to, to, con to come up with a kind of, to check. So they have like these snarks that check. Uh, so that's one example where these things are used in practice today. I'm gonna talk about it a little more later. I mention it, yeah, thanks. Okay, so Adam, I'm gonna go back to, get to your question a bit. Okay, and by the way, these snarks always assume, to generate these snarks, we assume that the parties agree on some shared randomness, and we'll see where that comes in. Actually, it's gonna, this shared randomness, essentially they'll agree on some hash function, but we'll see where that comes in. Okay, so what I wanna do today is talk a little bit about the journey of kind of constructing these snarks. And this journey actually study started with the notion of zero-knowledge proofs. So zero-knowledge proofs are proofs that reveal no information about why the theorem is true. And uh, it was put forth by uh, Golda Sermikal here at MIT and Rakov. Uh, and uh, it was noticed that to construct the zero-knowledge proof, we need to depart from the classical proof model and go to interactive proofs. Okay, so interactive proofs are very important for us as well. So what are interactive proofs? Interactive proof is a proof between a prover and a specific verifier. So usually we can construct a classical proof, we put it out there, anybody can verify. An interactive proof is actually a conversation between a prover and a specific and a verifier, so it's kind of per verifier. And it's a conversation back and forth. And importantly, what gives this kind of uh, interactive proof, what makes it interesting, uh, or gives it its power, is the fact that the verifier is random randomized. So the prover, when the prover sends a message, he does not know what question he's gonna get from the verifier, because the verifier is randomized. Okay, and that's kind of what gives it its power. The soundness guarantee in interactive proofs is probabilistic. So it's not computational, it's against all powerful adversaries, but it's probabilistic, which says if a cheating prover can, con that a cheating prover can convince a verifier to accept a false statement, he can convince, but with some small probability. And we're not so worried about this probability, so we say, look, even if the statement is false, you can be fooled to accept it. But we're not so worried because by repetition, we can get this probability down to like exponentially small. Okay, so if you repeat it k times, let's say the probability is half to begin with, the probability half, you accept a false statement. By repeating it k times, you get the probability down to one over two to the k. 
Uh, so it's essentially zero for practical purposes. So we're not so worried about this probabilistic soundness. OK, so as I said, this kind of interactive proof was put forth for the goal of doing zero knowledge. But what's interesting for us uh, in the context of SNARG, of the succinct certificate, it turned out that these, these interactive proofs are much more powerful than classical proofs. So what, let me give you an example. Ex take, for example, a uh, configuration board of a chess game. Okay, and suppose my statement, what I want to prove to you is that the black player has a winning strategy, which means no matter what the white player, which, which move he makes, the black player has a move, such that no matter which move the white player makes, the black player has a move, and then the black player will win. How do I, I, I don't know how to prove it using a classical proof. The only, exam, the only way I can think of is giving the gigantic tree of like, no matter what move, I have a move, and at the end, I'm going to show you that the black player wins no matter what. But that's a huge proof. Turns out that with an interactive proof, we can do that very, very succinctly. OK, that's a really, really nice. This is, by the way, what's called in general the IP equals P space theorem for, for experts here. But the problem with these interactive proofs is that the runtime of the prover, in order to convince the prover that indeed the black player has a winning strategy, the runtime of the prover is gigantic. And kind of in the worst case, it can go from like if the time to kind of uh, compute this task, let's say is t, to prove it can be up to like 2 to the t. Or in general, it's exponential in the space required to do the computation. But it's, the point is, there's a huge computational burden. So the completeness guarantee that we forget about the fact that it's interactive. We want non-interactive solutions. So somehow, kind of we're in the interactive world all of a sudden. We'll, we'll make sure to make it non-interactive. But also, even if we make it non-interactive, this is a problem. The prover here runs in just to, to generate like this proof. It's a huge, huge computational burden that in practice, there's no way you can do it. It takes exponential time. OK, so that's not good. OK, so the first thing uh, we did is we constructed what's called a doubly efficient interactive proof, where but we want the verifier to be very, very efficient, but also the prover cannot just be all powerful. Okay, so we want to ensure what an interactive proof. Let's say, let's say going back, we want to prove that a program M, a Turing machine M, or uh, on input X outputs Y in time T. What we want is that the prover that convinces the verifier that indeed the output is Y runs in time not much more than T. So in theory, we say polynomial T. In practice, we want linear in T and I, you know, with good constant. You know, in general, the overhead should be minimal. And the verify should be very, very efficient. Okay? That's kind of the goal. OK. And what the first thing I want to show you is a dub, such a doubly efficient interactive proof. So we're still interactive. We'll make it non-interactive in a bit. Still interactive. But also not for all uh, computations, going back to Adam's question. For now, we're only going to consider computations that can be represented as bounded depth circuits for now. So here's my computation. Okay, Suppose I have a computation. It's a circuit. So you can think of a Boolean circuit for simplicity. And it can be very, very wide, but it's shallow. Okay, So the depth, the number of kind of layers, is small. Okay, How small? I don't know. It could be polylog. It could be the input size, but much smaller than t, because the verifier is going to run in this depth. Is going to pay with the depth. OK, so just to give you a sense, my goal is here to give you kind of a sense. How would we go about giving an interactive proof prove that, to prove that the output is you know, correctness of this computation? So here's the idea. The idea is very simple. So the first idea is the following. Let's say the prover wants to convince you that the output is 1. I want to make sure he's not cheating. Yeah, that's my goal. I want to make sure you're, so you're trying to prove me. I want to make sure you're not cheating. You tell me the output is 1. I'm like, how do I know? So I tell you, you know what? Give me the two children. You give me the two children. I'm going to check consistency that that specific gate is satisfied. Now, if you cheated, one of the two children are false. It must be a cheat. I'm going to guess. I'm going to say, OK, let's, well, maybe the left one was a cheat. Then I tell you, OK, give me the two children. 
If the left one is a cheat, one of them is a cheat. I'm going to guess maybe the right one was a cheat. And I'm going to go down until I reach the input. And then I check if the input is right. I know the input. I, you know, I know what the input is. So now, now I'm going to catch you. And this is a trivial idea. And, and, uh, and, and it's not a good one <laughs> either. Because the reason it's not a good one, because each time I have a probability half of kind of losing. You know, maybe you, you were cheating, but I chose the wrong one. And this is a, a, actually a good answer. And now, uh, you know, you'll pass. So actually, the probability of the verifier to catch you, I need to guess correctly in each and every layer. And therefore, I only catch you with probably two to the minus depth. That's a bit pathetic. So I want to improve this. And the idea, so I want to make sure that in each level, I catch, I'm correct with probably close to one, not half. And the way I do it is using what's called error correcting code. So I do everything kind of in an encoding. So I'm not going to give here the details, but that's kind of the, the idea is the prover will encode kind of each layer of the circuit using some error correcting code. And the error correcting code will still do, will still kind of reduce checking a value of one uh, element in, in a layer to you know, the element below it, but we'll do it in the encoding. And by moving to an encoding world, we can guarantee that if a value is not correct in some layer, in the layer below it, it's, you're also going to be not correct with very, very high probability, not half. OK, and the probability we'll get is like we can make it bigger than, well, we can make it very close to 1, but in particular, 1 minus 1 over the depth. So now our protocol, I, I didn't explain to you what, how, what this reduction is, but essentially the protocol is kind of similar to the trivial one before, but over error correcting code. And, uh, and it will again go from like, delay, like depth, many kind of uh, uh, interactions, where we start with a value in the output layer. We'll do a reduction protocol to reduce it to check a value in layer one below. And then we'll do another reduction protocol to reduce it to checking a value in layer one below and so on and so forth until we get the input layer. And then we, it reduces to checking a value in the low degree extension of the, in the uh, error correcting code of the input, and that the, proof, the verifier can do on his own. So essentially, the idea is exactly as before, but we get around losing the probability half to losing with very, very small probability by doing everything on encoding. Now, how do you do it on encoding is actually a bit complicated. I don't want to, I, I don't have time to go into it. Um, but uh, this reduction protocol of kind of going from layer, whereas before it was trivial, you just check the gate and that's it. Here, the reduction protocol from a value in some layer i to a value in layer i minus 1 is more complicated. And it's done using what's called a sum check protocol. This is kind of a very commonly used protocol in, in uh, uh, theory of computation. Um, so basically, these things, uh, this error correcting code and this sum check is kind of, it's not an arbitrary error correcting, error correcting code. It's, uh, we use kind of uh, algebraic ones, in particular, uh, read Muller codes or low-degree extensions. So there's kind of uh, very nice, elegant algebra involved, but nothing too complicated. So this is, this is all I want to say about verifying low depth computations. OK, so where are we? I promised you a snarg for any computation. What did I deliver? An interactive protocol. No snarg, interactive. Not all computation, but only bounded depth circuits, where the verifier pays with the depth, because for each depth, we run like this little you know, sum check protocol or this little reduction, uh, kind of reducing verifying values in you know, the various levels of the circuit. So that's what I, I delivered so far. OK. This, by the way, is referred to the, in the literature as the GKR protocol. So I'm going to refer to that in here as well. OK. So I need to deliver more. So let me uh, continue. So first of all, this is only bounded depth. I want to get around this depth. Why bounded depth? I want to say, so I would like to say any circuit. So any circuit is kind of 
as general as you can get for computation because it's, it's complete. At least theoretically, it's complete. Uh, you can convert any computation to a circuit. Uh, so why, why am I, st yeah? I, I do, good, good, good. So I do need to convert to an infinite, an infinite family of circuits, but now when I wanna, I, let's say there's a general function and I wanna prove that this function on input x outputs y. So I only need to look at a circuit of where the input is length n. So now I'm kind of only look at, looking at input sides of length zero to the n, and now I have a circuit. So you're right, in general, if I'm a uh, function is a family of circuits, but one, once I have a specific input in mind, I just, have a circuit with that specific input length. It does need to sit in memory. Oh, good. So, uh, let, let me just say so, what, what Adam was saying that this is uh, converting it to a circuit is highly impractical, that's kind of a problem. So there's a lot of work. I'm, not, I'm just assuming you have the circuit. There's a lot of work in the community going exactly that. Like how do you um, kind of go from a nice string machine or different models of computation uh, to these kind of circuits? There's a lot of work there that I'm not even talking about. So I'm kind of focusing on one specific aspect of, of the solution. There's a lot more research going on in optimizations on other ends. You, you can go directly in Turing machines, which is also impractical many That's times. So yeah. Well, you can always, yeah, but you can, you can always think of a, circ of a Turing machine as like almost a circuit, right? Like, but there's also on RAM machine, there's an RC1 circuit, there's, there's a, a lot of work on various models. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, I, I switch to polynomial size. Yes, 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 yes. You're right. So this is relevant for circuits where, like, you can compute them in polynomial time efficiently. Otherwise, there's no point in doing this. So we're thinking of, like, uh, uniform models of computation. I'm just representing it here as a circuit. Uh, but... As Vino said, you can think of it also, like also as a Turing machine. Like just think of the Turing machine, and kind of uh, you can think of the layer. There's ways to think about a Turing machine. There's many, but I, I, the truth is you shouldn't think of it too much in either a circuit or a Turing machine because I think really in application they they have better better conversion and better ways to look at it. So this is more just kind of from above, like the main ideas, the high level ones uh, to make this practice I th in practical a lot of. Uh, engineering ideas come into play that I'm not mentioning at all. A, okay, so I'm not going to talk about how to reduce the depth here, like how to take care of the depth. There are actually ways to do it by kind of squashing the circuit, like taking any circuit, first squashing it in a way, uh, and then working on the squashed circuit. I'm not going to say much about that. Uh, the high, high level idea is you take the computation, you write the entire computation and you, the circuit is like just verifying that everything is correct and that's very shallow. But I don't wanna men t talk about that, so let's just leave bounded depth for now. But there's also an issue of interaction. I gave you an interactive solution. I promised you a certificate. So how do I get a certificate? And the way I get a certificate is by exploiting one property of the protocol, of the GCAR protocols that I, I did not mention that the sum check has, that the kind of this little reduction protocol from layer to layer has. And that property is that it's public coin. Public coin just means that the verifier's message questions are just random. So the prover sends a message, the verifier sends back a random question, completely random zero one, you know, uh, string. All, all the verifier's messages are just random strings. This is very nice property. Okay, this is called a public coin uh, uh, protocol. And it has a nice, it's very nice because we have actually ways, this is called the fiat Jamir heuristic, for eliminating interaction from interactive protocols. 
So, so far, the GKR protocol has statistical soundness. I gave you a way of proving correctness of any bounded depth computation where you cannot cheat. Even if you're all powerful, you cannot cheat. Where does cryptography come into play? By using the Fiat-Chamir paradigm. So what we do, we show how to eliminate interaction from this GKR protocol. How do we eliminate interaction? So the idea is very, very simple. Instead of having, so let's look at an example. Suppose you have three messages, just for simplicity. So the prover sends alpha, verifier sends beta, prover replies with gamma. Beta is random. How do we replace the verifier? How do we eliminate interaction? We, we tell the prover, you know what? No verifier. Instead, you compute beta by being hash of alpha. Okay, so there's some hash function that they agree on. Okay, that, can, that was the shared randomness. So we agree on some hash function. I know, SHA-256, whatever hash function you want. We agree on some hash function. And now, in, in a sense, instead of interacting with a verifier, interact with the hash function. That's the idea. It's very, very beautiful and simple. Okay, so instead of going alpha, then waiting for a question beta, then computing an answer gamma, the prover does everything on his own. He computes alpha. He sets beta to be hash of alpha and computes gamma. And now he has a snarg. That's the snarg. Anybody can verify. They just verify that indeed beta is h of alpha, and they verify that the verifier would have accepted this transcript. OK, so this is a very, very nice heuristic for converting kind of interactive protocols where it's important that beta is random, because once you hash alpha, you, it's essentially a random string. Uh, and, <coughs> and, uh, and for any public coin protocol, you can eliminate interaction in this way. This is the snarg. OK, that's it. Do GKR, do a Chamir. You have a snarg, at least for bounded depth computations. Done. OK, the one thing that uh, is still kind of questionable, OK, it's a very nice heuristic, but is it secure? Is it actually sound? And actually, w our understanding of this heuristic is still not fully developed. So here's what we know. In practice, it's sound. It was never broken. We never had a breach that was due to the fiat Chamin heuristic, as far as I know. OK, so we should be able to prove that it's sound, no? So can we prove it? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Actually, we have negative results. We have protocols that are sound. You apply the fiat Chamin heuristic, it's not sound anymore, no matter which hash function you use to reduce interaction. Moreover, let me say even more than that. The first SNARG heuristic construction was from the 90s, actually by Mikali here at MIT. It relies on the fiat Chamir heuristic. So again, it, he started with the interactive protocol, applied fiat Chamir heuristic to make it a SNARG. And in that specific protocol, we know that it's broken. The fiat Chamir heuristic fails. So why would it work for GKR? So the answer is, in these examples, where the heuristic failed, in theory, uh, the interactive protocol we started with had only computational soundness. So it didn't have statistical soundness like the GKR protocol. It had the property that if you're all powerful, you can cheat. A prover can cheat. So then we asked, OK, what if we apply the fiat protocol to statistically sound proofs? Then can we prove soundness? So we spent a lot of energy, uh, a lot by here, people at MIT, Vinod, me, a lot of others. Uh, yeah? Suspense? Uh huh. When you say it failed, you mean that it's sound? No. When I, when I say it failed, it means no matter which hash function you use, it fails. We can prove that no matter which hash function. So of course the fiat mean will fail with some, they're bad hash functions that we know. So we know that there are hash functions which you don't want to use for fiat mean. For example, constant functions. I don't know, like uh, ridiculous functions. But uh, now one, so now can, one can argue, oh, it fails with a specific hash function. Avoid SHA-256, avoid SHA-3. But these negative results show no matter which hash function you use, it will fail. So it's a, it really shows a failure of the paradigm. OK, but it's for computationally soundproof. I see you're dying to say something. It works in practice, but the real question to ask is, does it work in theory? 
Yes. Um, so, OK, so the answer is, for statistically sound interactive proofs, actually, we believe it, it works, it's sound. We managed to prove it sound, but under very strong assumptions. Frankly, I'm not sure I believe the assumptions. You know, it's a very, very strong assumptions. I don't know. Uh, but at least it's interesting. Uh, but for the GKR protocol, and for a, actually a pretty large class of protocols, the GKR is one of them, we actually prove that it works under standard assumptions. So under learning with error, for example. We have other, other so like DD, uh, yeah, uh, DDH. But so so, th so we, we do have a SNARG, at least for bounded depth, I showed you under LWE. We can extend it for all, reduce the bounded depth, but I, I don't have time to, to show, to talk about that. OK, so let me just kind of uh, tell you a little more about this, about this kind of area, unless there's questions. OK, so uh, you know, what I talked to you now is, of course, very theoretic uh, line of work. This uh, area is kind of a uh, joint uh, effort between uh, theoretical you know, theory and people who are doing more applied systems work. Uh, there's a lot of prototyping of these ideas, a lot of work, as I said, on the front end, the back end. You know, there's a lot of uh, uh, various kind of contributions by many people, a lot of uh, here prototyping. These are the GKR-based proto protocols but in yellow, but there's a lot of other techniques that I didn't uh, uh, mention. Uh, these things are deployed. Uh, the, uh, as uh, you know, w was asked, uh, the main, currently the main place where these are deployed, embarrassing, embarrassingly enough, is in all these uh, blockchain companies. But who knows how this uh, will, uh, you know, how this will evolve? Um, I do want to say, along this kind of journey of, uh, of, you know, thinking about these questions of verification uh, and constructing snarks and so on. We found a lot of in, uh, kind of this path was very, very inspiring and fruitful in ways that have nothing to do with snarks. So on the way, we managed to solve really interesting problems that have nothing to do with snarks, just kind of the techniques, which was kind of very uh, interesting. For example, we proved the hardness of finding Nash equilibrium. What does that have to do with Nash equilibrium? Via snarks. Uh, you know, we got hardness of approximating the value of linear programming. You know, what does linear program have to do with it? Uh, contribution on quantum complexity. A lot of contributions to cryptography, like aggregate signatures we didn't know how to do before, uh, zero testable encryption, and, uh, and the fiat Chimera paradigm, which was actually originally used to construct signature schemes, not for proof systems. It was for constructing signature schemes. So it was kind of a nice journey where we learned, I think, a lot uh, on the way, and kind of just uh, wrapping up with kind of a look ahead on what we're working on now and the interesting open questions, especially for uh, the students here, uh, that I think is really, really uh, interesting to, to think about. So one question that we were, uh, we've been obs obsessed with for a long time is forget about a certain computation. Let's talk about proofs. Okay, so suppose I have a mathematical proof for some theorem. I have some proof. It's very long. Who wants to verify this proof? Can we come up with a snarg instead? So I don't know, when we submit our papers to conferences, I don't know, you know, you can get a, to review a paper that has like a 100-page proof. Who wants to read that proof? Maybe we can have a succinct snark that will kind of convince us and we don't, you know, uh, instead of reading this entire thing. So kind of this kind of is in general, can we do snarks for NP, for non-deterministic? Can we take an NP witness and make it shorter using cryptography? So we have a lot of heuristics. We have made partial uh, uh, kind of adma advancements towards this, but this kind of holy grail problem is still open. And then finally, uh, another two things that we're working on uh, now is verification of quantum computations. That's one. Where here the idea is that the verifier, so the difference in, uh, in um, uh, resources is that the verifier is classical, but the prover is quantum. He wants to prove to the verifier that he did a quantum computation correctly. So there's a lot of work on this. And the last one is verifying machine learning uh, um, algorithms or models. And he really, one of the main challenges is, how do we verify, let's say, that the training data is valid? When we say the machine, machine learning algorithm produces correct answers, what do we mean by correct? What does it mean that an algorithm is good? So there's a lot of kind of new challenges 
that are raised and kind of were inspired by all these kind of uh, learning models uh, that, that are out there. OK, so let me just uh, 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 conclude by saying I think this entire journey has been a really successful uh, success story for theory of cryptography. Uh, mainly due to the interplay between kind of theory and practice. It was a really nice uh, kind of interplay. Uh, this is in the process of being standardized via an effort called ZK proofs, ZK for zero knowledge. All these proofs can be made uh, zero knowledge. And then lastly, I want to uh, thank all my fantastic collaborators, most, actually all of which were, oh, most of which were here uh, at, at MIT. Okay, thank you. <laughs>